It's impossible to discuss NBA greatness without discussing championships. For some players, it's their main claim to fame. People say Jordan is better than LeBron solely because of the number of their respective rings. Bill Russell versus Will Chamberlain is still debated to this day when their numbers aren't even close. Why? Because Russell has more rings than fingers and Will only managed to win two. Some players' legacies like Dirk Nowitzki were saved by them finally winning a ring before retirement. But what about those that have never won a championship? Names like Elgin Baylor, Allen Iverson, and Patrick Ewing are all on a list of all-time greats who never won a ring. Because of lacking this one achievement, we bring their entire careers into question. But what do those who played with them or against them have to say? And what about the man who is arguably the best player on that infamous list, Charles Barkley? Today, we are going to go over his career and a few NBA players and coaches quotes about just how good Sir Charles really was. Charles Barkley is probably more known now for his Emmy-winning television performances and cracking us up with his irreverent humor. What younger viewers might not know is that for a while, the round mound of rebound was the greatest player in the league, second only to Michael Jordan. Up until the recent appearance of Zion Williamson, Barkley was really one of one. People say that Barkley was undersized for his power forward position, but that isn't entirely accurate. Yes, he wasn't any taller than the aforementioned shooting guard MJ, but he played it nearly 50 pounds heavier. Remarkably, he was even larger in college, with some reporting that his weight was actually in the 300s. But don't think that made him earthbound. If there is anyone in his era that understood vertical explosiveness, it was NBA legend Dominique Wilkins, who when talking about seeing Barkley in college suddenly dunk on his teammate said, and I looked at this guy like, how can this big guy get all his weight in the air? Whatever physical gifts Barkley possessed, his combination of mass and athleticism led him to average 11.7 rebounds a game. Now remember, the man was only the size of a tall guard and played against legends like Kareem, Hakeem Olajuwon, Karl Malone, Patrick Ewing, all of whom towered over him. But being built like a cannonball, opponents fighting for the rebound just bounced off him. And it wasn't just raw talent that got him his impressive rebounding numbers. Outside of his one-of-one -one body, he matched it with one-of-one -one edge. There was an infamous moment during the revered Dream Team in 92 Olympic run when matched up against Angola. After some choice remarks prior to the game by Sir Charles, of course, the Angolans elbowed him multiple times during the game. By no means is it uncommon for players to throw elbows in the paint, but those who do usually know that it can come with consequences. Barkley, attempting to be the bigger man, let it go once. Then he let it go twice. But after another elbow that once again did not get called as a foul, he decided to return the favor. After an immediate whistle and technical foul, Barkley unapologetically jogged up the court. Hall of Famer and fellow Dream Team member David Robinson was later quoted saying, I thought, what are you doing, Charles? <laughs> the guy is half your size. But you know, Charles was an equal opportunity abuser. But don't think he came into the league with that tenacity, though. Barkley famously put on even more weight prior to the 1984 draft in hopes of avoiding being picked by Philadelphia. But nevertheless, he was still their selection with the fifth overall pick. But being drafted by a Sixers team who had just won a championship two years prior, Barkley was surrounded by seasoned NBA veterans as well as legends such as Dr. J and Moses Malone. Understandably, Barkley saw little playing time given the contending nature of the team, but it no less frustrated the young Charles. One day, a fuming Barkley pulled Moses Malone aside to talk to him. Charles complained to the three-time MVP, why am I not getting to play? To Malone responded brutally, cause you're fat and you're lazy, young fella. You're fat and you're lazy. Charles let those words sink in as he knew they were more or less true for the future Hall of Famer. But Malone didn't walk off to leave Barkley to stew in his thoughts. He told Barkley, you need to lose some weight. If you want to work, Big Mo will help you. Now being mentored by the living legend, Charles cut his weight from roughly 290 to 250, and his career took off from there. Having developed his desire for greatness with the work ethic to achieve it, he had gone from a bench warmer to the face of the team for the later half of his stay in Philadelphia. 
Being the sole team other than a solid Hersey Hawkins on the team after Dr. J retired and Malone was sent to play at the time with the Washington Bullets, it was a terrible trade that lost them both the great center and two first-round picks. In return, they received Jeff Ruland, who only suited up for five games with them before retiring, and a Cliff Robinson, who was on the tail end of his career. Now, this didn't stop Barkley from carrying the team to the playoffs for all but two years in his stay there. During this run, Barkley finished second in the MVP voting multiple times and did so in an impressive fashion. Here was this short power forward who made players nearly a foot taller than him look small. Keep in mind what era he was playing in. In the later years of the 80s, he had to go up against the infamous Bad Boy Pistons and Larry Bird Celtics, and don't forget the ascending Bulls led by Michael Jordan. Then, after facing those teams in the 80s and the 90s, he then had to face the gritty New York Knicks, where Charles had to battle in the paint with the likes of Patrick Ewing and Charles Oakley. Not only did he accept that challenge, he often succeeded in the face of it. Laker legend Jamal Wilkes said about Barkley, He was just one of those rare players that size didn't matter. It was just determination. Still, while he took his pound of flesh out of those legendary teams, he could only take the struggle Sixers so far. In 1992, he was traded to the Phoenix Suns, who at the time were already a playoff caliber team and a trade that only bolsters Barkley's claims of an incompetent Sixers front office. They only received now coach Jeff Hornacek, Tim Perry, and Andrew Lang. Barkley proceeded to win his one MVP that year and took the Suns to the finals to run into the buzzsaw that was the Chicago Bulls. Notably, Barkley's Suns are considered one of the best teams the Bulls dynasty has faced. The following years, Barkley's Suns would lose repeatedly to the Hakeem Olajuwon-led Rockets, who would go on to win the championship both years. Barkley, his time in Phoenix having run its course, was then traded to the same Rockets team that kept him from a second trip to the finals. This formed one of the first teams to be referred to as a super team. Sadly, him, Hakeem, and other Rockets star Clyde Drexler were all past their prime and he'd never win his ring. It's a common topic in basketball circles, given the drastic changes the sport has gone through since the grit and grind of the 90s, to wonder which older stars would excel in the modern game. Michael Jordan going against defenses that couldn't hand check, for example. Barkley playing in an era with power forwards like Draymond Green, who are well under the expected size for their position, would be interesting. The closest comparison to his style of game would be Julius Randle who, when aggressive, uses his overwhelming strength against smaller wing defenders and shorter center of gravity and quickness to maneuver around more lumbering bigs. Combining that with the greater focus of bigs developing their small ball skills, the Charles Barkley of today would, ironically, be hated by the Barkley that we see on TNT today. You see, Barkley has had a history with hating the three-pointer and jump shot-centric nature of the modern game. And if there is one thing he hates on the basketball court more, it would be finesse bigs who don't punish opponents on the block. But for his day, Barkley was extremely well-rounded for a big. He was known to put the ball on the floor and run the fast break. He'd play make, and much to his misfortune, given his sad three-point average of only 26.6%, he attempted his fair share of threes. League and Finals MVP Bill Walton is quoted as saying, Barkley is like Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and that they don't really play a position, Bill Walton said in a Slam Magazine issue ranking NBA greats. He plays everything. He plays basketball. There is nobody who does what Barkley does. He's a dominant rebounder, a dominant defensive player, a three-point shooter, a dribbler, a playmaker. Now, imagining a world where the one-of-a-kind physical specimen like Charles was being unleashed by the modern basketball philosophy is why we've all been so excited for Zion Williamson to enter the league. He was the closest we've seen to Barkley, but it looks like Zion doesn't have the guidance of a Moses Malone to help him manage his weight. Maybe one day we'll see a player like Barkley, but so far it looks like he truly was one of one. And that is it for our video today, so what do you think? How much is Charles Barkley's legacy harmed by him not getting a ring? Do you think that the great power forwards of the 2000s, Dirk, Duncan, and Garnett are all correctly ranked higher as all-time greats at their position? Let us know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you would like more videos like this uploaded daily. We will see you next time.